Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, we'd like to thank the organisers for asking us to speak. Um, so in this talk, we will discuss the background of the study and the underlying theories of health environment as they apply to the history of Malvern as a healing place uh, before discussing our preliminary observations of our study site. I knew I'd go for the wrong thing. There we go. Um, this paper presents the preliminary findings of a project into the environmental history and archaeology of, the local, uh, of a local nature reserve at St. Wolfstone's uh, in Worcestershire. It is part of a larger investigation uh, into nature reserves and other post-World War II conserved landscapes in Worcestershire and elsewhere. The overall aim of this wider study is to explore the various meanings of wild, wilderness and wildness in both contemporary and past societies. So Wilson's is an example of a hybrid garden wildlife nature reserve. The gardens were not planned or designed. They grew up organically around an emergency hospital in the years after World War II. The plantings continue to survive because the managers of the nature reserve want to celebrate the heritage of the landscape as a hospital and as a garden. We would argue that the surviving trees and shrubs are a form of natural monument and as such need to be considered as part of the overall archaeological interpretation and recording of the site. This grew out of a piece of teaching-based research. Students on my environmental course would pick a wildlife site to research, and it soon became clear that there were many interesting questions around these locations and how they had developed. Uh, and the three places picked as pilot projects had all formed the basis of studio pro student projects and, and were suitable for this uh, investigation. So there's one at Vicious Fields, one at Devil's Spitalful, and one at St. Wilson's. Um, the Catholicism of it is uh, accidental. Um, now, these pilot projects we use to develop uh, a methodology, and it's a hybrid drawn from archaeological, ecological history and heritage. We have completed a preliminary walkover at the site, together with an examination of the relevant mapping and documentary sources. We have also discussed informing the site with key members of its management uh, and the volunteers who set up the reserve. So we're basically just uh, wait, working our way through this list. If we consider the history of therapeutic landscapes and therapeutic horticulture, several authors such as Claire Hickman, uh, Parr and Plankington, all draw attention to the origins of these things uh, in the idealised romanticism of nature in the late 18th century. However, when we come to look at the gardens that actually were designed, they're more likely to evoke the settled pastoralism of the Georgic than the wild torrents of the Wordsworthian imagination. And some contemporary critics dismiss this approach. Uh, Hickman quotes Lord Macaulay as the old flimsy philosophy of the effects of scenery on the mind. It's quite scathing, really. Um, and we see that environment in therapy uh, declined after the 1930s. Uh, and Sempick and Aldridge have noted that there was a failure to create new hospital gardens after the 1930s uh, and hospital farms and other sort of, uh, not completely, but a lot of uh, horticultural therapy went out of use. Um, and this they attribute uh, to a lack of funds and labour in the aftermath of the Great Depression uh, and World War II uh, and a new focus on interior spaces, uh, both of uh, the patients um, but also uh, interior spaces of hospitals and the use of a new set of drug-based therapies. So we're working that the theory behind therapeutic landscapes is that environment is an important element along with drugs and treatments for determining medical outcomes, whether that is in general medical health environments or mental health environments. As one of the doctors who works at St. Wilson's argues, so this is uh, Dr. Query here, by changing the environment of the role of the patient, the hospital aims to help the patient overcome their condition and the effects of hospitalization, enabling the patient to rejoin society. Uh, and much more recently, uh, Hickman would argue that the reasons why the, 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 the scientific approach uh, that suggests that environments are good for patients uh, changes, uh, the essential nature of what constitutes a hospital garden uh, and the patient role within it has remained the same. And, you know, we can take that concept. The concept that environment might have a determining role in human society and on the individual is one that has been overlooked within archaeology in recent years. Environment, we would believe, has a critical role to play in understanding people's sensory world, both in the past and in the present. And as Ingold and others have pointed out, 
environment is central in hunter-gatherer societies to individuals' understanding of themselves. And he says, in their account, there are not two worlds of nature and society, just one. And we would agree with this, that if we are understand, to understand the environment, uh, we need to move away from this division between mind and body and culture and nature. As scientists, however, we need to be able to conceptualise the environment. And that is very difficult to do as a totality. <coughs> so, as a working model, um, I've used some ideas from uh, the environmental historian uh, Chris Mout, uh, that one way of categorising how people perceive and act in the environment is in the following way. So, he talks about use and delight. So, people use uh, the environment, they interact and with environments and they create hybrid, novel, unstable ecologies. Uh, and they also take pleasure in the environment and they change the environment to suit that idea of pleasure. Equally, people don't like landscapes and they don't like environments and there's quite a lot of animus in that uh, and we discussed that earlier with vandalism. And then finally, uh, I want to look at these things in terms of the overall land health of a piece of ground. How is how healthy or otherwise is that environment as a use as a result of these uh, activities within it. So just to turn to the wider context of the site for a moment, uh, Malvern has for some time been regarded and has marketed itself as a place of health and well-being. In the middle of the 18th century when Dr. Wall, a well-known local physician, wrote about the purity of the water which poured from the springs around the hills to the establishment of clinics for the so-called water cure in the 19th century. The health-giving qualities of the waters have been heavily promoted. They contain nothing at all. On the foundation of its reputation as a spa, Malvern acquired other features which contributed to its claim to be a place of well-being. It became a place of resort, more generally an early tourist destination. The foundation in 1862 of Malvern College as a boys' public school began a mushrooming of educational establishments, uh, eventually including a large number of private schools. In the later 19th century, threats to the hills from quarrying led to the passing of the first Malvern Hills Act and the establishment of the Malvern Hills Conservators uh, to manage the hills and surrounding commons uh, as a place for the public for recreation purposes. And the hills have been an inspiration for poets and musicians from Langland to Elgar. In the mid-20th century, these aspects of well-being were partly drawn upon and partly augmented by the necessities of war. Malvern was identified in the early days of World War II as a safe place for the evacuation of some government offices and even the royal family. And the vitally important radar research and development established was moved in 1942 from the south coast to Malvern College. With the entry of the United States into the war and the subsequent planning for the Allied invasion of Europe, a further element was added. Beginning in 1942, a huge organisation was set up by the US Army uh, to provide health care for servicemen. And this included a group of five hospitals uh, built at the southern end of uh, the Malvern Hills. And we're going to talk about this one at Brick Barnes uh, <coughs> there. So the timeline that we're, we're just going to discuss is basically from 1943, when the emergency hospital was built, uh, up until the present day, um, and various different hospitals used these buildings um, uh, until they were demolished in 1995, uh, and the nature was over set up. So this is the hospital in 1945. <clears throat> As you can see, basically they just plunked it down into this set of fields. Um, they even just put the hospital through the hedge line uh, and left the hedge behind. And parts of that hedge still survive uh, today quite impressive. Um, all of these units all have the same pattern, um, parallel lines of long single story wall buildings on the, this side uh, and in, then on the other side of the site with the accommodation for staff um, which uh, was developed later. Uh, the southern part of the site was always left open, uh, it had been a recreation field before the site was built uh, and the servicemen used it to play baseball uh, and other activities. After the war, um, it was <coughs> empty for a while, uh, and then they decided to shift the TB hospital to it. So, of course, you have to remember after World War II, TB was a very serious, very dangerous disease. Uh, people liked to put the hospitals far from population centres as possible. 
partly for the health giving benefits, but also partly because uh, populations <coughs> didn't really like them locally, uh, and there was some issue with setting this up. Uh, but we think this reputation of Malvern as a healthy place was part of the attraction for setting up uh, this TV sanatorium in the 1950s. Uh, and the fresh air and pleasant environment was emphasized in later accounts, uh, and much was done to the grounds to make them an attractive place for patients' recreation. So it's at this point that they start to develop the garden, they plant new trees, uh, they plant flower beds and do various such things. The gardens really, though, began to develop under uh, when it was a rehabilitation hospital. So in the 1960s, the new St. Wilson's was a pioneer in the rehabilitative treatment of mental patients. So you have to remember at this time, there were a lot of very institutionalized mentally ill people in the hospital. And one of the challenges at the time was to rehabilitate these people so that they could rejoin the community. Uh, and St. Wilson's was very successful in this. Uh, by 1977, 1,200 patients had been referred to the hospital uh, and 40% had been returned to the community. Uh, and the figures we have is that only around 5% of uh, patients in asylums were ever really successfully rehabilitated. And it was based on a, a gestalt theory that the patient's environment, both psychosocial and sensual, uh, is <coughs> crucial to their recovery. Uh, so this is a postcard of St. Wilson's. It's quite sweet. It's been annotated by someone who used to work there. So uh, various different things. Um, and you can see uh, it was a large complex site. There are other parts that are not on this postcard. Um, and the gardens had really been transformed. So uh, we have a mix of trees and shrubs. We have um, pear and apple orchards. We have vegetable gardens. We have a cricket field, a football field, a tennis court. Uh, and we also have formal flower beds, which you can just kind of make out there. Uh, this was during a campaign to save it, so it's a save some distance where uh, futile as it was. Um, so the hospital had its own newsletter. It was produced at regular intervals throughout the year. From these documentary records, we can get a sense of the emotional connection people felt to the site and its gardens and the kind of sensory environment that was afforded. The overall success of the gardeners can be summed up in this patient comment on the challenges of leaving the hospital for work. She said, how can you expect us to give up the green tranquility of the rehabilitation hospital for the hell of a factory? Uh, eventually, she was successfully discharged, just not to a factory. She kind of went somewhere else. And, and we've looked at one of the years to see, get an idea of the agricultural year or the, the garden year within the hospital. So in 1990, 1981, like most years, uh, the hospital had a newsletter, had a regular gardening column, and a series of descriptions of local gardens that were open and could be visited by patients and staff. There were regular updates on the progress of the bedding plants, which were sold off to staff and patients and visitors, uh, on the 15th of May, the 5th of June, and the 19th of June. The editorial for spring is a nice example of the use of garden both for therapy and delight. So, the editor says, the standard of the grounds at St. Wollstone's is superb and accredits the head gardener and his staff and his patients. So the patients were a key part of this. Uh, another bonus, he goes on to say, another bonus available to the staff are the fresh vegetables and both bedding and houseplants in season. What is nicer than a meal complemented by freshly gathered and cooked veg. Congratulations to Mike and his many men. I, for one, consider myself lucky to be able to work in such a beautiful setting of peace and tranquility. People, however, still display their animus towards nature. So when the deheading of numerous flowers on the drive occurred, there were a call for people to be vigilant to catch the offending children. So, you know, kids as always. Um, so these records provide us with useful clues as to how the garden was used and enjoyed, not only by staff and patients, but also by local people who could play tennis, football and cricket at the site as well as attend the fets and other parties uh, put on at the hospital. It would be wrong to think of this as a closed, separate space. It was full part of the community. <coughs> so this is the hospital now, um, a recent Google Earth image. You can still just about make out that pitch line going through. Um, uh, with the closure of the hospital, the majority of the shrub and tree planting on the nature reserve section have survived and have been incorporated within the reserve. 
the older trees that survived from before the hospital have been tagged and recorded and have management plans to maintain them as pollards and standards. Because of the flat level nature of the site and the good quality of the footpaths, it is a recommended place for patients convalescing from a variety of operations and conditions as a good place for rec recuperation and exercise. So GPs, local GPs, um, actually advertise this as a place to go. In terms of land health though, this field has always been of poor agricultural quality. It's now a brownfield site, um, so it contains a number of restricted areas which are fenced off from the general public. Uh, likely hazards are probably things like chemical waste from the laboratories, uh, which do turn up every now and again, uh, potentially radiological waste from the hospital. When they redeveloped the site, they found some ammunition, uh, and also heavy oil and diesel, asbestos and concrete. So it's quite a polluted site. Um, and this waste has polluted the soil, and it is noticeable that in places the vegetation is noticeably thin, and some of the trees have failed to develop properly. So, in terms of future work, we want to finish uh, the tree and shrub survey. There's a potential earlier site, so we're going to do some archaeological geophysical survey. Uh, we might do uh, a little walkover survey, things like this nice NHS 1980s cup turn up every now and again. Um, uh, but it's really the, the tree and shrub survey uh, that we're interested in. So, just to conclude, um, despite its origins as an emerging hospital, St. Wilson's grew into a much loved and admired community facility. The unpretentious and potentially ugly buildings were softened by a planting scheme which mixed formal flower beds and a mixture of deciduous and coniferous plantings. The garden provided an outlet for patients who were not suitable for the industrial work the unit specialised in, and several patients were rehabilitated as gardeners. The gardens I think we can consider accidental. Um, the plantings representing the individual choices of the head gardener and the hospital house committee rather than an overall design. As such, what now survives gives a rare insight into this period of hospital landscapes. Although the garden was not central to the mission of the hospital, it is clear from the time, effort and care put into it that at this hospital the environment was considered in a holistic sense of what Dr. Query referred to as the psychosociological environment but also the surrounding sensory environment of the physical and biological landscapes was considered important. Uh, and we have a nice uh, poem there from one of the uh, inhabitants about how much she liked it. Thank you. Thank you.